the resistor R in the figure dissipates 20 watts of power to determine the value of R. So, we have come down and have redrawn the circuit, but we've added a couple of labels, and let's talk about those labels. Take a look at the 75 volt battery. We have a positive terminal and a negative terminal. From the positive terminal of the battery, we're going to get current flowing away from that terminal. We have labeled that current I. Now that current I will flow through this resistor and then eventually it's going to reach this junction right here. And when it reaches that junction, it's going to split up into two different values of current. Now you can see from the diagram, we have labeled the current that's flowing in this direction I1 and the current that's flowing downward in that direction. We've labeled that I minus I1, but let's talk about why that would work. So look at that junction again right there, and we're going to apply the junction rule. And basically what the junction rule tells us is that the total current that is flowing into the junction has to equal the total current that is flowing out of the junction. Now, let's look at currents that are flowing into the junction, and in fact, the only current that's flowing into that junction is I. So we would write I for the total current flowing in. For the current flowing out of the junction, you can see it's the current flowing to the right, it's also the current flowing down, so we're going to add those currents together. We're going to go and add I1 plus the other current, which we've labeled I minus I1. Now when you simplify this, you could see that the I1 and the minus I1 would go to zero, and you're left with I equals I, which is a way of checking that we have properly labeled currents and have properly applied the junction rule. So that justifies the labels for the currents that we have included. But now what we're going to do is apply the loop rule. And for our first application of the loop rule, we're going to be traveling around this loop of the circuit. And as we travel through the loop, we're going to be keeping track of potential changes. Now, before we do that, let's just recall that a potential change, according to Ohm's law, would be the resistance multiplied by the current. In addition, whenever we encounter a battery, the potential change is just going to be the value of the volts given on that battery. So, let's get started with our first loop rule. Imagine that we started at this point right here and we're going to travel around our loop, our yellow loop, in a clockwise direction. Now as we do that we're going to encounter the 75 volt battery and we're traveling from the negative terminal to the positive terminal so we have gained electric potential. Because we have gained electric potential we're going to have a positive value and that is positive 75 volts. So we have gained 75 volts of electric potential. Now, as we go through the circuit again in a clockwise direction, we're going to encounter this resistor right here. Now, you have to ask yourself whether we are moving in the same direction as the current or whether we are moving against the current. Now, I hope you can see from the drawing that as we move this way clockwise through the yellow loop, we are moving in the same direction as this purple current. And whenever you are moving in the same direction as the current, as you travel through a resistor, you will have a negative potential change. That's very important, so I'd like to state that again. As you're moving through a resistor and you're moving in the same direction as the current, that will incorporate a negative change in potential. You're losing electric potential. And Ohm's law tells us to take the resistance and multiply it by the current. So we're going to take the resistance of 5 ohms and multiply it by the current that we have labeled I. Now we continue moving through the yellow loop and we're going clockwise so we're going to move this way in the direction of that black arrow and we encounter the 30 ohm resistor. Again, ask yourself, are we moving through the 30 ohm resistor in the same direction as the current or in the opposite direction? And I hope you can see that we are moving again in the same direction because that purple current arrow is pointing downward and we are moving downward. So same direction indicates a negative potential change. We take the resistance value of that resistor, which is 30, and then multiply it by the current that's flowing through that 30 ohm resistor. Remember, that current was I minus I1. So we'll include that here. We continue in a clockwise direction until we return to where we started, that black point right there. And once you return to start, you set your total potential changes equal to zero, according to the loop rule. So that's going to be one of our equations that we will need to solve this circuit. Now, let's clean things up just a little bit. And let's not forget the next phase, which is going to be another application of the loop rule. So this time, we're going to be 
traveling through the rightmost loop. We'll color it in green this time. We can start anywhere we want in the loop, so let's just start here. And again, let's go in a clockwise direction. So as we go in a clockwise direction, we're going to encounter the 40 ohm resistor. Remember, the current going through the 40 ohm resistor is going that way. So we are moving in the same direction as the current. We'll have a negative potential change. So it's going to be negative, and then the resistance is 40, and the current flowing through that 40 ohm resistor is I1. We continue our way through the circuit and we encounter the resistance of unknown resistance value. We're moving clockwise, we're moving with the current, we'll have a negative potential change. That's going to be the resistance R that we do not know, multiplied by the current I1. And then we continue in a clockwise direction and now we encounter that 30 ohm resistor again, but watch out. The current flowing through the 30 ohm resistor is moving downward, but we're moving upward in this clockwise green loop. So this time we're moving against the current. That's going to be a positive potential change. We take the resistance of 30 and we multiply that by the current, which is I minus I sub 1. We return to that black point and therefore we set the total potential change equal to 0. Now, what I would next like to do is solve that second equation for I. We're going to see why that will be useful in just a moment. So let's come down here. We're going to simplify it. So what we'll do first is we'll distribute that 30. And then, and then what we'll do is we'll combine the like terms. We have negative 40 I1, negative 30 I1. That'll make negative 70 I1. Remember, we're trying to solve this for I. So we're going to actually, to both sides, we're going to add this term as well as this term to both sides. Those terms will cancel on the left-hand side. And then finally, to solve for i, we will divide both sides by 30. We will then factor out an i1 just for a little bit of ease of calculation. Notice, too, that when we factor out the i1, we can reduce this fraction. Those zeros would cancel. So we'll factor out the i1. That's going to give us 7 thirds plus r divided by 30 and then that's going to be multiplied by I1. So this is not our answer, of course, but this is something we're going to hang on to. And what are we going to do with that, you might ask? Well, let's go back to the other equation. We're going to sort of copy and paste it. We're going to simplify it, and then we're going to make a little bit of a substitution here. So here was the first equation. We're going to go ahead and distribute this negative 30. And then the, we should have some, some like terms here. So I think it looks like those are like terms. We'll make that a minus 35I. Maybe to simplify our lives just a little bit, we can come in here and divide by a greatest common factor. Why don't we divide everything by 5, including the 0? That's going to kind of knock the numbers down just a little bit. And now at this point, we can probably make our substitution. Recall from our earlier analysis at the top of your screen here that I was equal to that crazy expression, 7 thirds plus R over 30, all multiplied by I1. So we're going to take that expression and we're going to substitute that for the I of this equation. So this term right here will be replaced in just a moment by that expression there. So let's go ahead and do that. Now this is pretty nifty, but it still contains two variables. You've got I1, but it also contains R. So we want to kind of make a replacement for R in terms of I1. That way we have just a single variable I1. Well, let's recall from the given information that the power that was going through or that was dissipating in the resistance labeled R, that power was 20 watts. Now, let's also recall that the current that's flowing through that portion of the circuit was I1. You can go back and look right here. That I1 was the current that was flowing through the resistance R. So what? Well, we might recall that the power through a resistor is equal to the current squared times the resistance. Well, we know the power is 20. We know the cur uh, current, excuse me, is I1. Don't forget to square it. And then we don't know R, but what we're going to do is solve that for R. So we divide both sides by I1 squared, and that's going to give us an expression for R. That's good because that R is in terms of I1. It's 20 divided by I1 squared. So we come down here, and for R, we're going to substitute in 20 divided by I1 squared. 
Now we have our equation, albeit a messy equation, in terms of a single variable i1. Maybe we can talk about how to simplify this little complex fraction right here. So you have 20 over i1 squared. That's over 30. That 30 can be written as 30 over 1. You're dividing fractions. You do what we call keep change flip. So keep the first fraction the same, change the division to multiplication, and then flip the second fraction. Now these zeros would cancel here. That's going to leave us with 2 over 3i1 squared. So that's what we're going to put in for that term right there. Okay, so now it's a matter of algebra. And again, this is a little thorny. Perhaps what we can do is distribute this i1. So this is going to become a 7i1 plus a 2i1, and then they'll be over their respective denominators. Now we can actually cancel a factor of i1 within that part of the fraction there. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to cancel out an i1 in the numerator and then an i1 in the denominator. So in the denominator, we end up with just an i1. Okay, not too shabby so far. Now to continue solving, we're going to have to distribute this negative 7. So we'll have negative 7 times the 7i1, and then the negative 7 times the 2. This is becoming quite fun, I'm sure you agree. So now we're going to have to multiply both sides of the equation by i1. We'll talk about why that's going to work in just a second. We distribute that i1 to here, to here. That's going to make an i1 squared. But when we distribute it over here, the i1 in the numerator will cancel the i1 in that denominator. So let's watch that carefully. You'll have negative 15i1 minus 49i1 squared. That's still over 3. And then we'll have a minus. Now here you would have 14i1 over 3i1. But again, those i1s cancel. So you're just going to be left with a minus 14 thirds overall. So that's minus 14 thirds. And then you're probably noticing that we even have to distribute it over there too. So now we're going to have a plus 6i1 squared. On the other side, we still have 0 because 0 times i1 is still 0. Now, why don't we next multiply everything by 3? This is, this is wild, isn't it? So we're going to multiply everything by 3. It's going to cancel the 3 in that denominator. It's going to cancel the 3 in that denominator. And that's the advantage of multiplying by 3. We can now combine like terms. These are like terms. Let's add those together. You're going to get negative 31 i sub 1 squared minus 45 i sub 1 minus 14 equals 0. Everything's negative, so if we divided everything by a negative 1, including the right-hand side, then these would all change to positive. So let's just keep everything positive. This is our current equation, and now we have to use the quadratic formula, unfortunately. So we're going to do i1 equals negative the b value, which is 45, plus or minus the square root of your b b squared, so 45 squared, minus 4 times your a, which is the leading coefficient of 31, and then times c, which is your constant term of 14. This will all be divided by 2 times your a value, which again is 31. So let's pick up our calculator and simplify underneath the radical. And awesomely, we get 289. That is awesome because the square root of 289 is a whole number. On the bottom, 2 times 31 looks like it's 62. The square root of 289 is 17, so that's pretty convenient. And now we just split it up into two answers. So you do negative 45 minus 17, divide that by 62, and you're going to get a negative 1. And then if you do the other answer of negative 45 plus 17 divided by 62, we get negative 0.45. Now it's no big deal that we got negative currents because all that means is our direction was chosen incorrectly. You might recall that we drew I1 traveling down the circuit. All it means when you get a negative answer is that it was in fact flowing up. So we could go back to the drawing and we could change that. Where was I1? Yeah, we had it sort of messy over here, but we had it sort of flowing downward like in this direction. That was the wrong direction, so it should have actually been going that way. But the good news is it doesn't affect the answer. All we have to do is change these to positive currents. And again, in the drawing, we change the direction of I1. So those are the two possible values for I1. But of course, we didn't want the values of I1. We wanted the values of the resistance. Well, that's no problem because we had an earlier equation for resistance. We're just going to borrow that and use it to calculate the resistance in just a moment here. So for the first value of current, We'll call this R1. We're just going to do 20 divided by 1 squared. 
So that's going to be, of course, equal to 20 ohms. So that's one answer. And then for the other one, we'll do 20 divided by the 0.45 squared. And on a calculator, that gives us about 98 ohms. So you get two possible answers for the value of R.